Well, good morning. Welcome to Only Baptist Church, our 11 a.m. service. I want to thank the music ministry for a wonderful music service this morning. And I want to thank our, especially our praise kids. Wasn't that awesome to have them up here? And so, um, and I want to thank Judy as our praise kids leader. She's the one that kind of corrals all. So I want to take you back in time to between uh, 1,200 to 1,500 or so years ago uh, before the time of Christ. So this would be about 3,500 years ago or so, a uh, long time ago. Uh, and scholars debate whether this was 1,200 or 1,500 years before Christ. I tend to lead toward 1,500. But at this time, uh, there was an old man. And, and, and I'm not insulting him because he was 120 years old. And when you're 120, you're old, okay? Uh, and so this old guy, 120 years, was uh, uh, sitting atop Mount Nebo in what is now Jordan, but back then was called the land of Moab. And if you haven't guessed it by now, this guy's name is Moses. Now Moses was led to the top of this mountain, Mount Nebo, and there's a picture of Mount Nebo over here. Uh, and this is an actual photograph of Moses over here. So, uh, and, uh, and so Mount Nebo uh, overlooked the, the land of milk and honey, the land that we are no, know today and what God called the promised land. Now Moses had disobeyed God uh, toward the end there and uh, lost his temper a little bit. And so uh, he uh, was not allowed to go into the promised land, but because of his faithfulness and his wonderful leadership, he was allowed the honor of uh, seeing the promised land that the children of Israel were about to occupy. And then the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy what happens next. So Moses is taken up. He, he sees this wonderful land that the children of Israel are going to go, and it's the last act of his life here on this earth. And Deuteronomy tells us, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, that's a wonderful thing to identify anyone by. Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he, God, buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. Now, normally, it's an honor to be asked to be a pallbearer at a funeral. In this case, consider Moses' honor. God is his pallbearer, personal pallbearer, and God is also the officiant of his funeral service. He is personally buried by God himself. But little did Moses know, this would not be the last we would hear about his body. Uh, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. Obviously, he was following a healthy Weight Watchers plan, or probably... Uh, Pat Nordstrom's uh, wonderful program. Uh, uh, and the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. And yet, at some point later, an incredible event takes place. An episode that we're told very briefly about, frustratingly briefly, in fact, in the book of Jude. And that's the main focus of our message this morning. For in the book of Jude, we're told in verses 8 and 9, Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. We'll get back to that. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Today, we conclude our series on the book of Jude. It is a short book, but as you can tell this last few Sundays, it's a heavy book. There's a lot of intense things discussed in Jude, a lot of things that aren't very fun. But today, we're going to talk about a very, very interesting component of the book of Jude, that's this story. And we're going to conclude with Jude's doxology, uh, which really tells you the entire purpose of the book itself. Now, Jude uh, lays out uh, in two verses what I believe are the themes of Jude. Uh, in verse number three, uh, Jude tells us that we are to earnestly contend for the faith. In verse 21, he says, keep yourselves in the love of God. And this really, if you were to uh, just, you know, what, is, what is Jude's purpose in writing this book? It's right there. That's what he wants to do right there. And he wants to encourage us to contend for the faith. Uh, there's a lot of people today that will fight for everything but what's most important. I mean, people will think about what people argue about and talk about and think about in general life. Most of us today argue about, think about, and talk about things that really don't matter a hill of beans in the grand scheme of things. Things that aren't going to 
matter tomorrow or the next day or even 30 years from now. I want you to think, for example, the last time you got upset during a day. Is that incident that you got upset about going to matter next week or next year? Is it going to matter 10 years from now? Now, in some cases, perhaps so. But in most cases, the answer to that is no. Because we get distracted by and upset about things that don't matter. And Jude is saying, if you're going to get upset, if you're going to fight for something, then fight for something that matters. Fight for your relationship with God. Fight for the Christian faith, because that matters. That matters. And Jude says you need to keep yourself in the love of God. Now, Jude's not saying that you have to earn your salvation or that you have to work your way into heaven or keep your salvation by your works. Let me just say right now, if we had to work for our salvation, we'd all be in trouble. We would all be in trouble. I'll be honest with you, I'd be in trouble. Imagine if not only we had to work for our salvation, imagine if we had to work to keep our salvation. I mean, I would be paranoid. I wouldn't want to go out of the house every day. In fact, sometimes I have problems in the house. You know what I'm saying? All right. Sometimes, you know, they say, I shouldn't have gotten out of bed. Sometimes you can have problems just staying in bed, you know. Uh, you know, your thoughts can go, get crazy. And, and you know, we, we are a sinful people. And we fall short. We're flawed. We're imperfect. And that's why we need a Savior. And that's why the grace of Almighty God is so incredible. And the Bible makes it clear that God's grace is unconditional. It's un grace, unmerited favor is mercy. And we, 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 we should be amazed by that and grateful for that. But we will never fully enjoy our salvation. We will never fully enjoy our relationship with God. We will never fully experience the peace of God if we don't keep ourselves focused on God. And that is what Jude is saying. You've got to keep yourself in the love of God. Stay, and Jesus himself put it this way, abide in the light. Abide in the light. You know, don't go for the dark. Go for the light. You know, he talks about Jesus, I am the tree of life. We need to abide in the vine. And so that is what Jude is contending for. Now, the whole basis of Jude is that, and this is, this is like uh, Vince Lombardi would always start. He was a legendary football coach, of course, of course. And he would always start football camp dealing with professional athletes by holding up a football and saying, this is a football. <laughs> and would basically take them back to the basics, okay? That's something the Washington Redskins need today, I think. But anyway, uh, and it's like, so the basics here, God is real. I know that sounds like, well, duh, I'm in church. Of course God's real. Think about it. God is real. That means that he's in control, that he is sovereign. He created the universe. He created all of life. He created you. And you are accountable to him. Well, I don't want to be accountable to him. Too bad. <laughs> Too bad. You're accountable to him. You know, God is real. And the whole basis of Jude is that we're serving a real God. Well, something else, Jude is very clear about the enemy is real too. According to one survey, a third of Christians believe the devil is an imaginary being, that the devil is merely a symbol of evil. Let me tell you something. The devil is not just a symbol of evil. The devil is the very embodiment of evil. He is real. Lucifer is a real being. There are demons, ladies and gentlemen. Devil and his demons are real. Well, how do you know? Because the Bible tells me so. In our next series, we're going to talk about the Bible. A lot of misconceptions Christians have about it and what it means to us and how much of a blessing and a gift it is to us. But the Bible says very clearly there is spiritual warfare, and that means the spiritual warfare is real. We are at war. And ultimately, we don't wrestle against each other, or we shouldn't. We wrestle against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this present world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, Paul says. And so all of this is the basis of Jude. And if you don't believe these things, you're going to have a hard time understanding Jude. Now, the devil wants to confuse, undermine, and divide God's people. Now, he's been at this and wanting to do this since the Garden of Eden. He divided Adam and Eve from God, and then, and then planted the seeds of division between themselves. You know, I mean, I mean, as soon as God caught them and held them accountable, what does Adam do? Take responsibility? No, Adam blames Eve, you know. And the little saying goes, Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. You know, uh, so uh, that's not original with me. So anyway, but... That, that's a, so, you know, the blame game and stuff. People point the fingers at each other and blame each other. He started it. It's our fault, whatever. I mean, 
we are, we, we are children today, frankly. The devil will try to get in and undermine and divide God's people. That's what he t- tries to do, and he does a pretty good job of it. Uh, and that's one of the main aspects of spiritual warfare. And it's the context of this contest between the devil and uh, My- uh, Michael the archangel. Now, Jude's exhortation is that we keep ourselves in the love of God and contend for the faith. We do these things by keeping our focus on God, abiding in his word, and doing life his way. If you don't get anything else today out of the message, get this, because this is the whole, whole purpose. You, know, you need to make sure that you are keeping your focus on God. Focus on God and nothing else and no one else. Focus on God. All right? Focus on God. And then abide in his word. That's his revelation. Abide in his word. Meditate on God's word. And do life his way. Don't do life your way. Do life God's way. God knows a whole lot better what you need than you do. And so that's the thing. Right there. Those three things. Now, uh, Jude then, so we get back to our, our episode here and explain this. Here's what Jude's talking about. Jude says, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, speak evil of dignitaries. And he talks about Michael not directly rebuking the devil, but saying the Lord rebuke you. And you're like, what in the world is that talking about? It's like, basically, this is an illustration. Jude is using this Michael and devil, Michael versus Lucifer contest as an illustration of a bigger point that he's trying to make. Okay, so let's understand the point first. Um, Who are these dreamers? You know, now, this is not like, you know, we're like, well, I dream. I, I, I've had some weird dreams. Anyone have weird dreams before? By the way, never eat Burger King before you go to bed, okay? So <laughs> I, that, I, I don't know why I learned that. But anyway, uh, you know, I've had some weird dreams before, and they're bizarre dreams. By the way, have you ever gotten, and have you ever, has your spouse ever gotten mad at you because of something you did in their dream? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, and have you ever gotten mad at someone because of something they did in, their, in your dream? You know, it's like, okay, all right. Anyway, anyway, so it's moving on. That's not part of the message today, but um, that's not the dreaming that Jude's talking about. Here, Jude's talking about people that have delusions, people that have their own. You ever met someone that has their own sense of reality? I mean, there's reality, and then there's your friend's sense of reality, you know, or, or the person that you're talking with, you know. Um, that's what Jude's getting at. People that have their own sense of reality, their own dreams, their own visions, their own idea of what life's all about, okay? And then he, he, he explains the, uh, he tells you exactly who these people are in verse 4. Certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. That means basically in God's sovereignty, God already knew who was going to, uh, you know, follow him and who wasn't. And so the, or, the judgment was foreordained from the beginning of the world, all that. Uh, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, so the New King James says lewdness, and denying the Lord God and our, own, our Lord Jesus Christ. So that... Those are the dreamers. These are the false teachers, the corrupt, toxic influences in the church. And that's who Jude's warning about. So those are the dreamers. All right, now here's what they do. They defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. So this is the, this is the bad stuff that they're doing in the church. They're doing this in the church. Now, uh, to defile the flesh, what does that mean? Well, here's the bottom line. We are, according to the Bible, if, you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior... Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you look at the history of the Bible, the devil's always trying to defile God's house. He's always trying to defile the temple. And in many times in the history of Israel, that, that happened. The, the temple was defiled several times. Idols were brought in and false gods and all that. Uh, so the devil's always trying to defile the church and defile God's people. But here's the thing that we don't get in this day and age. And this is very important. This building is a building that we have set aside and dedicated to God's use. So therefore, we should be good stewards of this building because we dedicated it to God's use, okay? But this building is not the church. We are the church. So if this building were to burn down tomorrow, only Baptist church still exists. The church, the people are the church. And, and I've often heard people say, well, you shouldn't do such and such in the church well, if, if, if it's a sin to do something in the church, then probably it's a sin to do it, period, because your body's the temple. Your body's the temple, not the building. Your body. This is not the holy of holies up here. Trust me, I wouldn't be up here if it were. You know. um, this, is, this, is, this is just, I'm up here on stage preaching God's word to you. All right, this is, but your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's very important to get that. Now, the way that Satan will do it is he will get you to defile your body and defile God's temple 
And he does that in a number of different ways. Your thoughts, your actions, whatever, it could be sexual defilement, mental defilement, emotional defilement, whatever, but basically he wants to put anything in your life that will corrupt and defile you. And we let him get away with that often. We let the devil get into our mind. We give the devil real estate in our mind that he should not have, that he's not entitled to have. And he will use false influences and toxic influences to do that. You have to, you have to really be careful who you spend time with, who you hang out with, and who you listen to and who you get counsel from. Because if you get counsel and listen to the wrong people, then you're giving the devil entryway into your mind. And you're giving the devil entryway into your life, and he can defile you for that. So these false influences, these false teachers are helping the devil defile the flesh. They reject authority. Have you ever heard the old saying, kids say it all the time, you're not the boss of me. You ever heard that? All right. Have, has, have your children, parents ever said that to you, by the way? Uh, you know, if I said that to my parents, <laughs> that would not have gone over well at all, okay? Now, I, I, we live in a day and age, though, where discipline is a bad word. Discipline's a bad word. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about discipline, a lot to say about parental authority. Uh, and parents, I'm just going to say right now, if you don't discipline your kids, then you're going to have to live with them when they're adults. And you're not going to like the way it turns out. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm not, the Bible talks about spare the rod, spoil the, the proverbs, spoil the child and all that. That does not mean you literally take a rod and beat your child with it, okay? I'm not, I'm not don't get up here and the pastor told us to abuse our children. I didn't say that, okay? I'm saying, neither did Solomon say that when he wrote the, when he wrote the proverb. But the rod basically was used by a shepherd. It's a, it's a shepherd analogy, okay? And so what, the shepherd used a rod to guide and prod the sheep, okay? And that's what you're supposed to do as a parent. And sometimes you're supposed to guide your children. And, and the staff actually had a hook in it where you could grab the sheep and bring that sheep over against their will, you know. And sometimes parents, don't you have to do that with your kids? Okay. All right. But, you know, today we've got parents that are surrendering their authority over their own children. We have a discipline problem in our home today. But the Bible's clear. And think about, think about what's happening in every area of our society right now. God is clear. There should be authority. There should be authority in the home. There should be authority in the schools. I hear horror stories about kids backtalking and disrespecting teachers and even assaulting teachers in some cases. And I'm not talking about special needs kids. I understand that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about kids that they might need something, but it's not, you know, it's, 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 it's they need a you know, swift kick in the rear end, you know, but they need. But anyway, they, uh, these kids that, 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 that assault teachers and yell at, you see, like, go on YouTube and watch some scary stuff, you know. And uh, we have gotten away from authority. There should be authority in civil government. And I said this when Barack Obama is, was president. I'll say it when Donald Trump is president. I don't care who you voted for. I don't care what your political views are. This church is neither Republican or Democrat. This church is about the kingdom of God. Okay? All right? But whoever the president is, whoever the president is, you need to respect that office because the Bible says you're supposed to. We're supposed to honor those in authority over us. We're supposed to pray for those in authority over us. And yet even many churches have a hard time with this today. There was a church in our area where President Trump came, asked to be prayed over. And they did. And then many people in that church were very upset about it. Now let me be very clear to you. I don't care who you voted for, what your political views are, but if a public official wants only Baptist church to pray over that public official, I don't think the president's going to come here, but you know, <laughs> if like our county executive or one of the county commissioners or something like that wanted to come here, we're going to pray over them because God tells us to, okay? All right, but a lot of people don't have any uh, desire for authority. There should be authority in the workplace. The boss is the boss. You don't like what the boss says? Get another job, you know? The boss is the boss. You know, uh, there should be authority in the community, authority in our government, and there's authority in the church. I know it's awkward for me to say this, but, you know, I mean, if you think I'm doing a bad job, you can remove me. I serve at your pleasure. It's in the bylaws. You can remove me. But as long as I am the pastor, I have some authority, okay? And you've got to follow pastoral authority. The Bible's clear on all of that. And, and yet today, we rebel against authority. And, the, and Jude is very clear that this is one of the marks of the false teachers and the ungodly influences in the churches. They reject authority. Uh, Speak evil of dignitaries. There's a lot of debate among scholars on what dignitaries means, uh, but dignitary basically is an ambassador. It's like a representative, 
And so is he talking just about angels? He's, he's talking about the apostles. Is he talking about pastors? And I think the important thing is this. Um, these, these false teachers were taking, were, were slandering and, and turning people against the people that God had put in authority. You go back to Moses. Moses was given authority over the children of Israel. And what did the false teachers and ungodly influences do? They tried to turn and rally the people against Moses and Aaron. And that's what they were doing when God pronounced judgment on them and said, okay, then your carcasses are going to mark this desert because I'm not letting you go into the promised land because they were re rebelling against God's authority. And so these are the bad stuff. These are the bad things that these people are doing. Now, here sets up Michael versus Lucifer. Now, this word dispute uh, is a legal term. So even though it'd be cool Hollywood special effects to picture Lucifer with a sword and Michael with a sword and battling instead, that'd be cool. You know, you can get a hold of Steven Spielberg and make that movie, man. Let's go. But that's, uh, that's not exactly the context. The, the, the scriptural context here is not like a clash of titans where they're battling with swords. This is a legal dispute, an argument that they're having. And they're arguing over the body of Moses. And we'll get to why they were doing that in just a moment. But God buries Moses... And then at some point after that, Lucifer tries to claim Moses' body. So Michael, which is the top archangel, he's like the chief dude in heaven right now, uh, other than God, of course, but serving under him. And as far as the angels go, he's like up there, really high up there. And Michael, the archangel, is dispatched to deal with that. And so Michael confronts the devil and won't allow the devil to take Moses' body. And so they have this legal dispute. Now... The devil is under God's sovereignty, according to the Bible. I'm getting a little deep here in theology, so bear with me here. And so you can, you can um, by the way, I, I resurrected my blog, and so I'm not trying to do a self-promotion here because I'm not selling anything on the blog or anything, but I'm gonna, a, lot of, a lot of the notes that I can't put into my sermon, I'm putting on the blog, okay? So, uh, pastorbryantubbs.com. Anyway, but I'm not selling anything, I promise. Okay, anyway, so, all right, but uh, if shameless self-plug. Anyway, so... Um, the, the battle between these two guys is a legal dispute, and Satan knows the rules because under God's sovereignty, Satan is the prince of this world. And so the God has allowed Satan to have some authority over this planet. That is why the devil and his demons are running amok. Not only that, but the legal dispute implies that Satan was basically challenging Moses and saying, hey, I, I can claim Moses' body. Moses was not a great great saint, and was probably pointing out Moses' sins to God and Michael the archangel, and saying, Moses already disobeyed God several times. He shouldn't get any special protection. He's mine. Michael refused to give up the body of Moses. And Jude says, but even Michael refused to personally judge or rebuke the devil. And that's the devil we're talking about, the, the number one evil guy in the whole universe. And even Michael refused to directly confront or directly challenge or directly rebuke or judge him. Instead, he says, the Lord rebuke you. Now, this is a parallel example, meaning that when you're dealing with authority over your life, it isn't an, it's, it's rebellion for you on your own tastes, preferences, opinion, and agenda to challenge and rebuke that authority that God put there. Instead, you've got to appeal to something higher than that. Now, we live in a day and age right now where there's a lot of confusion, if you haven't noticed. People are very confused today, very confused over what's right and what's wrong. And in spite of being very confused over what's right and what's wrong, people argue all the time. In fact, the greatest American sport pastime is no longer baseball. It's now outrage and argument. And just go on social media today. People are at each other's throats all the time, arguing, 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 fighting, fighting, fighting over everything. But yet there's no standard or criteria to determine objectively who's right and who's wrong. Let me give you an example of how these arguments normally go. Here is a picture of one of my favorite candies. All right? Now, how many of you like candy corn? And we'll admit to it. Raise your hand. Okay. All right. Cool. All right, how many of you do not like candy corn? Okay, all the people raising their hand right now are wrong, okay? <laughs> You're wrong, all right? You're wrong because it tastes good. End of story, okay? Now, right, so I, uh, 
I, <laughs> Eric has helped me with a message today. So I, I yes, it, it, that is my, we'll get to that in a second. But I'm saying you're wrong. You're going to say, no, I'm, you're, you're going to say you're right. What's the objective standard? I can't appeal to my taste buds because those are my taste buds. Now, by the way, I want to say this is, uh, th I love this candy, but Jane will not let me eat it. Uh, it's not on the approved uh, list of foods that I can eat at home. So we never, we never get candy corn. Uh, so I'm not, allowed, I'm not allowed to eat it, so I just miss it, you know, and kind of, you know, mourn for it. Uh, but to the, this morning at the 9 a.m. service, Dave Sella gave me some advice. He said, look, it's a vegetable, so tell her that, you know. So I don't know if that's going to fly either. But, uh, but this, is, uh, this, this is something I like, but there's no objective standards. Some of you like it. Some of us don't. Some of you don't. I like it. But, you know, some of you don't. All right. There's no, it's just a matter of personal taste and preference. America today, and it's pretty much the way around the world, but I can only speak for America. America today argues over politics and religion the same way we're having a little fun debate over candy corn. Only people are at each other's throats today because everyone sources their truth in something that's not objective. Now, uh, I, there are, well, by the way, when it comes to, if there's any arbiter, any arbiter that people are now looking to to kind of settle disputes, it's feelings. <laughs> How dare you offend me? You hurt my feelings. And if you hurt my feelings, automatically that makes you intolerant and a bigot and you're wrong. My dignity is at stake. Let me just say something. Can we agree it's unhealthy for you to base your dignity and self-worth on the opinions of other people? Amen. Okay? But that's what we're doing today. I love this cartoon. These are football announcers. It's not his knee. It appears his feelings are hurt. And the team psychologist is rushing onto the field. So, so that's a great cartoon. And that's pretty much where we're headed today. So uh, now here's our options today when it comes to, well, how do you decide what's right and what's wrong? And here's your options. Either truth is relative or truth is absolute. It's either relative or it's objective. You can't have any other option. This is a true binary choice here. Either um, definitions and meanings and terms are fluid and can be defined by, by, according to the whims or needs of society or the person or whatever, and it's relative, or truth is objective. It's absolute. So if I identify as a Martian, then if truth is relative, then you have no business telling me that I'm not a Martian because I just am because I identify that way. See, truth becomes just a matter of identification instead of something objective. And that's, that's the mess that we're in today. And if there's any arbiter, it's my feelings. My feelings are hurt. I want you to really think this through. Really think this through because this is what's going on in our society today. Now, I'm going to tell you that uh, truth is absolute. It is not relative. Now, I will agree that our relationship to the truth is sometimes relative. Our perspective is relative, but truth itself is objective. That means it is outside of you and me. Now, Os Guinness said, truth is true even if nobody believes it, and falsehood is false even if everybody believes it. Truth is not a matter of public opinion. It's not a matter of uh, checking the public opinion polls or any of that. Truth is objective. Now, look, this is chilling, and this is a chilling warning about what can happen to societies that reject truth. This guy was a philosopher in the early 20th century. His name is Alexandre Courier. He's from France. And he wrote this, the official philosophies of the totalitarian regimes. What's he talking about? He's talking about Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Soviet Union. He's talking about communism and Nazism and fascism because Mussolini was in power in Italy at the time he wrote this. The official philosophies of the totalitarian regimes unanimously, they all agree on this, they brand as nonsensical the idea that there exists a single objective truth valid for everybody. The criterion of truth, they say, is not agreement with reality, but agreement with the spirit of a race or nation or class that is racial, national, or utilitarian. If you, if we as a society, and we're heading there, once we as a society reject objective truth, the alternative is it comes down to survival of the fittest. 
which tribe is most powerful and which tribe can impose its preference and will on the rest of society. You are sowing the seeds for totalitarianism if you reject objective truth. Os Guinness again. Far from being a naive and reactionary notion, truth is one of the simplest, most precious gifts without which we would not be able to handle reality or negotiate life. Um, there are some people that will say, well, wait a minute, this isn't fair because other cultures believe the truth is relative, you know, and, and some people will point to the East. Well, Ravi Zacharias, one of my favorite Christian authors and speakers, is, a, is an authority on this because he comes from India. And Ravi Zacharias said, look, the, the people in India may quite often believe that truth is relative, but when it comes to crossing the road, they still look both ways because it's either them or the bus. All right? The reality, we all know, we all know deep down that truth is objective. We know it. If you don't think about it for a second, I, I, I have not tried this yet. Maybe one of you that believes in relative truth can give this a shot, and if so, you could report back to me how this works. But... If I go to the bank and I say, I'd like to withdraw $10 million. And the bank teller says, I'm sorry, Mr. Tubbs, but right now you only have $20.52 in your account. And I'm going to say, well, that's your truth. My truth is that I'm a multimillionaire, so give me the $10 million. I don't think that's going to fly. Now, you could try that and see what that works. Or try this. If you're driving on Georgia Avenue, not that anyone here ever speeds, but let's say that you go a little bit above the speed limit and you get zapped by that annoying speed camera right there, okay? And, uh, and you, get, you get zapped by going over the speed limit. Why don't you, inst to dispute the ticket, you just write in and say, look, truth is relative. You say I was speeding. The camera says I've been speeding, but what is the camera? You know, in fact, we're all just figments of our imagination, you know? <laughs> We're all, we just exist in a matrix of, of different perspectives and different truths. And so therefore, who are you to impose your truth on me? Um, you know, I, I trust me, you're going to end up paying the fine, okay? That's, that's not going to work, all right? But that is, here's the, when it comes to simple realities of life, like money, sports, um, the law, people understand that truth is objective. People understand that. But when it comes to religion and politics, people get stupid. All right, and that's the reality. I know people don't want to hear that because it's like insulting, but you know what? So what, okay? We get dumb and stupid when we get to this because we don't want to hurt our feelings. We want to do what we're going to do and we don't want to tell us otherwise and blah, 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 blah. That's the postmodernism, deconstructing narratives and all that. And, and we got to not be stupid. There are no brownie points for being stupid. Now, George Washington, I got to use a Washington quote because it's his birthday yesterday, okay? Truth will ultimately prevail where there is pains to bring it to light. I love this quote because it tells you that truth is often painful. And the reason why people reject truth is because it is painful. No one wants to face the truth oftentimes. A lot of people will avoid getting a health diagnosis or they'll be in denial if they get a, the bad health diagnosis because they don't want to face up to it. Some parents are in denial about their kids. Some spouses are in denial about their marriages. It's easy to be in denial because we can avoid reality and avoid the truth. But you know... Truth may hurt, but we need it. Truth is important. Don't reject the truth. Um, so the Bible contends that God is truth. Truth is objective, and his name is God. Truth is embodied in God. Just as God is love, God is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. God is truth. Now, you will probably encounter people that will dispute that, but here's the options. When it comes to sourcing truth, you only have these three options. Either I say, people say, or God says. I want you to think about when it comes to sourcing moral truth, objective truth, even scientific truth, truth in general, making truth claims. You only have these three choices. I have debated numerous people from numerous perspectives online, in person, over the years, in panel discussions, in, in everyday conversations and whatever. I have never heard anyone dispute this. It can't be disputed. This is, this is irrefutable fact. You only have three choices when it comes to sourcing or grounding truth or a truth claim. Only three. There are no other choices. And those three are either truth is based on the individual or truth is based on a group. That group can be a local community, a cult, a church, 
a larger denomination, that, that community, that group could be the entire country, or it could be the world, or it could be public opinion polls, but bottom line is it's either I say as an individual, or people say collectively, or God says. You have no other option. This is it. This is it. Now, I'm telling you that human race has tried those first two quite a bit. The human race has exhausted its history trying those first two, and it's always failed, often with disastrous results. The only option that works is that truth and meaning comes from our creator, our creator. You say, wait a minute, religion's caused a lot of problems. I didn't say religion. I said God, our creator. Because quite often, organized religion falls into people say, where basically uh, you get certain powers, religious people in authority, and they will masquerade as representatives of God, but they're really just imposing their group will. Okay? So I'm not talking about organized religion. I'm talking about God. God determines truth, because he is truth. Now, Timothy Keller will tell us, and here's Gis, getting, getting, bringing this back around to Lucifer and the devil fighting over Moses' body. Timothy Keller tells us every person, religious or not, is worshiping something to get their worth. I want you to think about it. Even if they don't believe in God or worship God, they're going to worship something, either themselves or they're going to worship some activity or some event, sports, money, sex, whatever. They're going to worship something, nature, whatever. Paul talks about people worshiping the creation instead of the creator. There was a seminary not too far from here where they actually had an activity where students prayed to plants. I promise you I'm not making that up. It's like Babylon B satire headlines are becoming real. All right? Uh, but Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We must worship the one true God. But the devil loves to throw out decoys and distractions. One of his main strategies is to decoy us, and so that even those of us who want to worship God, and I'm going to assume that all of us here, if you're here on a Sunday morning church, you want to worship God. So here's what the devil's going to do with you and me. He's going to throw out distractions and decoys and get us to think we're worshiping God when we're not. So this is a fighter plane. Our fighter pilots are trained. Uh, when a heat-seeking missile locks on them, they put out a decoy to distract the missile, okay, and to throw the missile off. The devil does that. Now, here is the body of Vladimir Lenin. If you want to see this body, uh, Lenin died a long time ago. But his corpse has been preserved as a symbol of communism and as the father of modern-day Russia. And uh, he is in, lying in permanent state, basically, and can be viewed at different days of the week in Moscow. So if you want to get on an airplane and go to Moscow, you too can see the body of Lenin. And many people, good question, <laughs> but many people have, have, have filed by and do, do now Soviet Union, officially atheistic. And yet people were worshiping, effectively worshiping Lenin's body. Uh, Kim Jong-il from North Korea, brutal dictator, died a few years ago, but you can still see his body. It's lying in state in North Korea. I would not recommend getting on a plane and going to North Korea, but you can if you want, and you can uh, uh, view Kim Jong-il's body there. But it's not just evil, brutal communist dictators that this is done for. Here is St. Anthony a Catholic saint from many years ago in Italy. His body was not as well preserved. As you can see, he's not looking too good right now. But you can go view his skeleton in Italy if you want to. Now, this is like comical in many ways, but it's not just other cultures that do this. I just mentioned George Washington. This is the top of the Capitol, and this is a fresco called the Apotheosis of George Washington. When Washington died in 1799, the entire country, understandably, was swept up in mourning and Washington fever, basically. And, uh, and so people wanted to design the Capitol building to pay homage to Washington. And so they painted, they, they, the construction took a while back then. It wasn't as quick as it is now. And uh, also, the British came in and interrupted things really inconveniently in the War of 1812, you know, kind of knocked down some buildings and stuff. But anyway, after the War of 1812, they continued construction. So it was finally finished around the 1820s, 1830s. And if you go into the Capitol today and take the tour, they'll talk about this. You go in, and you look up, and you see this fresco that was painted, and it basically is an image of what might have been the assumption of George Washington. So in Washington, 
uh, died, his spirit left his body, and was welcomed into heaven, according to this fresco. And you could see heaven turning out and welcoming him in. The apostles are there, Jesus is there, and all of that. Now, if you turn and look down, straight down, uh, there's like a hole in the ground, and you should be looking into a sarcophagus that they designed, and that would be where the body of George Washington would be. So you look up and see the assumption, you look down, and you could see his body. That's the way they wanted it. Even Martha agreed to this, uh, Martha Washington. But George put in his will that he wanted to be buried, just buried in peace at Mount Vernon, his home. And so one of his descendants later said, you know what, we're not going to do this. And so they refused to give up Washington's body, and that's why Washington is still buried with his family in Mount Vernon. And I would say, thank God for that, because I don't think George Washington would be comfortable with people worshiping his body. Uh, and certainly I can tell you that God would not be. But this is, why, this is why the devil really wanted Moses' body. Can you imagine if the Israelites had the body of Moses, what they would have done with it? Can you imagine what we would do with it today? You know, uh, Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. We are not supposed to worship corpses. We're not supposed to worship dead saints or dead people. We're not supposed to worship any of that. We're supposed to worship God and God alone. But here's where it gets real, real dicey. Because some of you are going to, like, that's right. Amen. I'm there. I got you. Worship God and God alone. But some of us, we have made up our own corpses. And we've made up our own graven images in our own minds. And what we've done is we've designed, listen to me carefully on this. We've designed in our mind our own image of God and our own caricature of the way God wants to be worshipped and the way God is. And we worship that instead of worshiping the one true God. It's happening in society overall, and it's happening even in our churches today. Think about how people will fight today over things that, in church, over traditions, over preferences or things, and they think they're fighting the Lord's fight. But yet, you you ask them, can you show me in the Bible where where that is? And they're like, well, uh, you know, they can't find it. Maybe it's in Second Opinions, chapter 5, verse 2, you know. (laughs) Um, but it's not, it's not anywhere in the Bible, you know, but it's strong. They hold it strongly because it's very, I want you to think about this. Where do you draw your comfort from? Where do you draw your identity from? What blesses you in God's house? Okay. What really do you come to church for? What really do you look for when it comes to worshiping God? If your answer is anything but God himself, then you're wrong. You know, we can be encouraged by other things. I, am, I love you all, and I love to be encouraged by you all. But ultimately, my job as pastor is not to please you all, it's to please God, okay? And you all, when you come to church, I hope I'm an encouragement to you. But if I say something that's wrong, you're not to follow me if I'm leading you off a cliff. You're to follow God, God alone, okay? It's trusting in God, God and only God, okay? He is the only one that has the authority. And here's the thing. If you end up using ungodly means to fight for what you think God wants, then chances are you're not fighting for God. You're fighting for the other guy. Because he's good at distracting us and confusing us and dividing us. We need to serve God. Only Baptist church needs to be about God and the work that God has put before us and nothing else. We're not here to serve any human being's agenda. We're here to do what God wants us to do. And our, our focus and our hope and our identity and our meaning and our comfort and all of that must come from God and God alone. Jude concludes by saying, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some, this is talking about some people that have been misled and gone the wrong direction on some have compassion making a distinction in other words you know not everyone's not everyone means ill some people are just honestly been misled and you need to have compassion on them and work on restoring them Uh, but others save with fear that means some people you know have compassion but they might need a knock upside the head you know they might need a little bit more of a mm, you know like you know get back on track kind of thing okay where you might need to show them you know what you should be afraid right now, okay? Because the Lord rebuke you, all right, on this. And so save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. And then I love this doxology as we close out today. Beautiful words from Jude. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Only God can meet your needs. Only God knows your needs. Only God is capable of sustaining your hope. Only God is worthy of your total dependence and allegiance. If you keep your eyes focused on God and keep your heart in him, he will bring you safely home. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for how awesome you are. I thank you for how faithful you are to us. I pray that we will be faithful to you. If anyone here today is dealing with a burden in their life that they would like prayer for, this invitation is open to them where they can be encouraged and we can pray for them. If anyone has questions about their relationship with you and where they stand with you, this invitation is open to them. I pray you'll give them the courage to come forward as we sing and pray with me or Brother Charles or Brother Kyle, one of our deacons, Lord. We would love to, to do that. If anyone here today needs to make a decision to be baptized or to join our church or whatever the case may be, this invitation is also for them. We commit it to your honor and glory alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll please stand.